Welcome to the Jurassic Park cast, the Jurassic Park podcast where guests chat with me about Michael Crichton's 1990 novel Jurassic Park, and also not that too. This quick episode is an excerpt from episode 33, Breeding Sites, where I track down the famous, but probably never ever looked at, West German study about West African frogs that Dr. Alan Grant famously alludes to to explain why including frog DNA to fill in gaps in Jurassic Park's dinosaur DNA sequences may explain how the dinosaurs are able to breed in the wild. So in the novel, Crichton writes, Look, who said, the fact remains all the animals are female. They can't breed. Grant had been thinking about that, He had recently learned of an intriguing West German study that he suspected held the answer. When you made your dinosaur DNA, Grant said, you were working with fragmentary pieces, is that right? Yes, Wu said. In order to make a complete strand, were you ever required to include DNA fragments from other species? Occasionally, yes, Wu said. It's the only way to accomplish the job. Sometimes we include avian DNA from a variety of birds, and sometimes reptilian DNA. Any amphibian DNA, specifically frog DNA. Possibly, I'd have to check. Check, Grant said. I think you'll find that holds the answer. Malcolm said, frog DNA? Why frog DNA? Gennaro said impatiently, listen, this is all very interesting. We're forgetting the main question. Have any animals gotten off the island? So Gennaro interrupts and halts Grant's explanation. So we have to wait later in the novel to have this explained. Uh, Here's a bit more discussion on the subject from episode 33. Okay, this next news story isn't new, nor about dinosaurs, but it is specifically... Jurassic Park related. Check this out. The Copia Journal, which is now known as the Journal of Ichthyology and Herpetology, published the article Protogynous Sex Change in the Reed Frog Hyperolius viridiflavus based on a series of studies performed in West Germany on West African frogs in 1989. This is the paper that Crichton has Dr. Alan Grant referred to. Though, while he was writing the novel, I guess the article wasn't yet published, so I guess Grant could only have said he'd learned about an intriguing West German study, which we're told on page 168, though not necessarily have read it yet. Well, this is the West German study on West African frogs. It says that sequential hermaphroditism has been documented for a few plants back in 1980 and is well known in invertebrate phyla, but in invertebrates, it has only been documented in fishes. There are two types of hermaphroditism. They say protandry, which is when you're a male first, and protogyny, which is when you're a female first. It was speculated in advance of this paper that sex changes should be more common than the existing data indicated, and these researchers document the protogynous sex change in a laboratory-raised population of reed frog, Hyperolius viridiflavus omatostictus. Now, this omatostictus subspecies occurs in East Africa between Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Miro, and the superspecies viridiflavus is found in most of sub-Saharan Africa, and there are also more than 50 recognized subspecies. All these reed frogs are well adapted to harsh environmental fluctuations of the dry and wet seasons of the African savanna. They must survive for many weeks, in some areas even for several months, on low amounts of water and small energy reserves stored prior to estivation, and estivation being like hibernation, except not just for the winter. Estivation is when an animal goes dormant in any season, where the conditions are challenging to survive. So, the paper outlines where, in these horrid conditions, frogs begin to mate. They mate a lot. They got to. It's literally now or never, right? So the juveniles attain sexual maturity as quickly as within three months, but may take up to 10 months, depending on the climactic conditions. And it said that adults, due to their different morphological and behavioral adaptations compared to juveniles, quote, probably cannot survive in areas that experience a pronounced dry season and are probably annual in such areas. As well, in lab studies, the adults rapidly senesced after breeding ends. They rapidly deteriorate with age. Previous studies indicated that if, in fluctuating environments, post-breeding survival is low, selection acts to increase reproductive effort. And further studies confirmed, where adult mortality is high, it's correlated with high reproductive effort, showing risk sensitivity with large clutches and multiple clutches in one season. This basically boils down to the aphorism, make hay while the sun shines. Research shows that there are incredible pressures placed upon these frogs. Sexually mature juveniles have to breed and breed often because there are two inevitabilities if they don't act quickly. The annual, unsurvivable dry season arrives, and they'll become adults, after which breeding becomes the death knell. So that's the world in which these reed frogs live. But what about changing sex? A hormone treatment, either by injection or by addition to aquarium water of the tadpoles, has been used successfully to change sex in amphibians 
1982, tadpoles of H. viridiflavus flavus were treated with testosterone, leading to the complete masculinization of the gonads. Quote, other environmental extremes like extreme temperatures or egg hypertrophy also override the genetic sex determining mechanisms thought to be prevalent in amphibians, according to the study in 1983. But the authors acknowledge, quote, no account has been published of functional sex reversal in amphibians under natural conditions, nor in the laboratory, without the kinds of experimental treatments discussed above. However, quote, many authors have reported cases of abnormality in the reproductive systems of amphibians found in the field in papers published in 1921, 1923, 1930, and 1944, accounting, quote, simultaneous hermaphroditism in rana temporaria, where two frogs have well-developed ovaries and testicular nodules with fertile eggs and spermatozoa. This paper's authors note, quote, no behavioral or life history data indicating that this occurs in the field were provided. But the data was irrefutable. They found samples with, quote, typical male secondary sexual characteristics in M. plexus, which is a fancy word for in the mating position, with a female, and later showed by dissection that this individual had two ova testes, structured like normal testes with only a few degenerate ova included. All offspring from the breeding experiment were female, showing that this individual, although having and functioning as a male, was probably a genetic female. In other words, they in fact observed a hermaphroditic frog successfully mating in the wild. The paper continues that protogynous hermaphroditism is favored under a series of conditions, one of which is when there is a differential male reproductive success that is age or size specific. This is facilitated by, quote, pronounced female choice for larger males, under which conditions a few males can monopolize all the matings and achieve a much higher reproductive success than any female could. Quote, a female changing into, into such a male age or size class could achieve a profound advantage. So let's tie this back to Jurassic Park. At Jurassic Park, we have a protogyne hermaphroditism, where a female has re reverted to becoming a male in an environment where there was, quote, pronounced female choice for males. In this case, an all-female population. This part holds up pretty good. What doesn't quite hold water is that these frogs have evolved to survive under extreme duress. Their environment rushes their sexual maturity, prioritizes their mating success, and the animals basically shrivel up and die after the mating season. In an all-female population under these mortal pressures, you can imagine how a species might adapt hermaphroditism as a means for the continuing survival of the species. An all-female population for a single season could mean the endemic devastation of their species. Grant's suggestion that, quote, some species of West African frog are known to spontaneously change sex from male to female in a single-sex environment kind of feels like an incredible oversimplification after reviewing this paper, eh? But it's fascinating all the same. Now, I have to clarify, for almost my entire life, and especially since reading Jurassic Park, I was sure that the term rana, R-A-N-A, that's given to describe the DNA used to fill in the patches, was a specific term for amphibian DNA. I couldn't imagine why amphibian DNA had a separate term. Well, that's just what I came to accept while breezing through this part of the book. And then it became kind of like just common knowledge, uh, sort of, right? But of course, <laughs> it's not correct. Rana is the specific name for a genus of frog. Like if you were to see the species and genus name for a frog, as prescribed by classic Linnaean nomenclature, you'd find that rana is a genus of frog. And then there are dozens of species of rana. Wood frogs, grass frogs, stream frogs, mountain frogs, amur frogs, spotted frogs, red-legged frogs, yellow-legged frogs, brown frogs, Greek frogs, Iberian frogs, Pyrenees frogs, no, not Pyrenees dogs, frogs, Sichuan frogs, groove toed frogs, and common frogs, 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 frogs. Rana doesn't refer to all frogs, though, but there is a long, well-documented, expansive family of frogs to which Rana does refer. And frankly, shame on me, the novel is actually pretty clear about this. Quote, the result was clear. All breeding dinosaurs incorporated Rana, or frog, DNA. None of the other animals did. Wu still did not understand why this had caused them to breed, but he could no longer deny that Grant was right. The dinosaurs were breeding. That's on page 210. So my mistake. I'm not blaming anybody else. My fault. Now, to wrap this up, Grant finally explains his understanding of this all on page 375 in the chapter Under Control. By the way, Muldoon said, turning to Grant, if they're all born females, how do they breed? You never explained that bit about frog DNA. It's not frog DNA, Grant said. It's amphibian DNA, but the phenomenon happens to be particularly well documented in frogs, especially West African frogs, if I remember. What phenomenon is that? Gender transition, Grant said. Actually, it's just plain changing sex. 
Grant explained that a number of plants and animals were known to have the ability to change their sex during life. Orchids, some fish and shrimp, and now frogs. Frogs that had been observed to lay eggs were able to change over a period of months into complete males. They first adopted the fighting stance of males. They developed the mating whistle of males. They stimulated the hormones and grew the gonads of males. And eventually they successfully mated with females. You're kidding, Gennaro said. What makes that happen? Apparently, the change is stimulated by an environment in which all the animals are of the same sex. In that situation, some of the amphibians will spontaneously begin to change sex from female to male. And you think this is what's happened to the dinosaurs? Until we have a better explanation, yes, Grant said. I think that's what's happened. And that's on 375. So, Grant here is chalking up the sex change stuff to a single-sex population, which overlooks the severe environmental pressures upon which this trait has evolved. But I guess if you've already inherited the trait... You don't actually require the extreme environment, just the single-sex population. And I can imagine once mating season strikes, you're getting ready to find a mate, and you find there are literally no males or signs of a male anywhere, and this process would be triggered. And Bob's your uncle, or Betty's your uncle, or Bob's your aunt. I'm not sure how this expression applies anymore, but you get the idea. You get to mating right away. Discussion. Movie adaptations. Here in the novel, the frog DNA study that Alan Grant refers to is a West German study about frogs that are West African. I looked to see if West German referred to a research company or something, but it seems to be just that it's from Western Germany. And to a bunch of millennials on the brink of being from Generation X, like me, who may not recall, Germany was split into a Western and Eastern bloc until reunification in 1989 when this book was being completed. So Jurassic Park exists in a world where the Berlin Wall still stands. A few differences between the film and the novel on the frog DNA stuff. In the novel, it's specifically referred to as amphibian DNA, and the phenomenon of gender transition is best documented among West African frogs, and it's used in only some of the species, specifically those which are breeding. In the film, however, uh, Mr. DNA tells us that all the DNA was completed using frog DNA. We use the complete DNA of a frog to fill in the holes and complete the code. Phew! And now we can make a baby dinosaur from the scene in the visitor center. Grant inquires that the dinosaur DNA includes amphibian rana and specifically frog DNA. Grant believes it's amphibian DNA that holds the answer to the breeding conundrum. Uh, the paper we read in the news section this episode says that hermaphroditism isn't specific to West African frogs, but rather that it's even more common in fish, more common still in invertebrates, and has even been documented in some plants too. All right, a big thank you for tuning in. If you're interested in more of the, the podcast, you can find it wherever podcasts are and look for Jurassic Park Cast. Include those hyphens in between uh, or Jurassic Park Podcast. That might work too. And if you like the videos, you can like and subscribe and receive notifications when new ones are available. There is a lot more to come. So stay tuned. Until next time. I, I used to worry about what people would say, but then nobody said anything.